Hello, everybody. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so very much for joining Perez Art Museum Miami virtually this evening. I'm Maritza Lacayo, and I'm the Curatorial Assistant and Publications Coordinator here at PAM. And I'm thrilled to be with all of you tonight. This conversation that will take place is a part of a series. It's our live studio visits program, which is presented with the generous support from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation and features local artists sharing their practice through visual visits with the PAM curatorial team. So of course, as a 21st century museum dedicated to representing the people and communities of South Florida, PAM continues to strive to be a forum for open, honest, and at times challenging dialogue while creating understanding through the power of art. And that's really how this program came to be. We are really at your service tonight. So we, we strongly encourage you to ask us questions as we move through the presentation. You'll note at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button. So please don't be shy. We're definitely here to engage with you tonight to answer your questions and to be as accessible to you as possible. Now, before I introduce our very special guest this evening, I did wanna take a, a moment to thank everyone at PAM who makes these studio visits come to life. And I'd like to start off by thanking Denise Faxis and Andrew Bird, our audiovisual team who work um, with all of us to make these virtual programs possible, um, including this one, of course, so thank you. I'd like to thank Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult Programs, who has been helping manage this series of programs and working alongside our very fabulous communications and marketing teams to make sure that you are all here tonight and that you're aware of this program. Uh, a very special thank you to Alexa Farah, Director of Marketing and Communications for her efforts in promoting this project. And a very special shout out to Patrice Carter, who has done such an incredible job of promoting these programs as well for the past few months. Uh, lastly, I reserve my deepest gratitude for our associate curator, Jennifer Inacio, who has really spearheaded this program and this project from the very beginning and has served as, as a helping hand uh, for each and every one of us while, while planning these conversations for all of you. So thank you, Jen, uh, for your continued support always, and of course, not just in this presentation. Uh, now, I would like to tell you a little bit about our guest this evening. Clara Varas is a Cuban-American artist and her work investigates the field of expanded painting and explores identity, displacement, and the concept of home. So having migrated to the U.S. at the age of seven, she creates works that reflect upon diasporic communities and often includes the term, use of the term um, hybrids to, to define her work. Um, she sees herself as an artist as creating work that's between painting, sculpture, and installation. Uh, the work is ever evolving and never necessarily finished. So I'll definitely be asking her what she means about that. Um, she has exhibited her work at Spinello Projects here in Miami, the Frost Art Museum, Museum of Contemporary Art North Miami, Boca Raton Museum of Art, and the Cintas Fellows Finalist Exhibition at the Museum of Art and Design, where she was a finalist for a Cintas Foundation Fellowship in Visual Arts. Varas earned her BFA in painting from the School of Visual Arts in New York. And lastly, I really wanted to mention that, of course, she's also a PAM collection artist. So without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm virtual welcome to Clara Varas. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I mean, thank you so much for for doing this. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, what you know, what we really want to do is just make sure that we're as accessible as possible to our PAM community, to everyone who is, you know, who's watching tonight. So I'll emphasize now and throughout the presentation that you know you guys have that Q and A button. So don't be shy. Anything you want to ask Lara or myself, we're definitely here uh, to to do that. But I figured we we just dive straight into it and we talk about the work that we have in the PAM collection, uh, the altar from 2016. This is a work that we acquired through our Young Collectors Council with additional funds from additional donors. Um, and I figured this could be a, a good anchor, a good anchor work, a good starting point for you to just talk to us a little bit about your practice overall, and then we can dive deeper as we go through and see the trajectory of your work. That sounds good. And now I'll, I'll start with this piece here. And so basically, as you said, my uh, practice deals with the idea of uh, expanded painting. And uh, what I mean by that is basically that, uh, I, I guess the best way to describe it is painting that kind of seems to wanna um, escape the, the traditional confines of the stretcher and kind of just like uh, jut out into uh, a room and 
and just, you know, take up the, the, the space, you know, beyond the traditional square or rectangle of a canvas. And um, working with that, I, I also introduced materials that are not necessarily or traditionally we associate with art making like uh, bed sheets and uh, this espresso coffee maker um, that you see and uh, it, it found objects, uh, human hair sometimes, uh, you know, clothing. So, so things that um, kind of uh, speak to the body and speak to industries, uh, speak of the world. Uh, and it, it kind of started as a way for me to kind of, um, think of the figure, but not necessarily um, use the figure in a, in, in a work. So like, for example, the bed sheets that you see here, um, which actually belong to my sister. So if she's watching, hi, <laughs> your, uh, your bed sheets are in uh, Pam now. <laughs> They're in the Pam permanent collection. <laughs> And uh, like uh, this espresso coffee maker. And uh, these are things that I used to uh, kind of uh, with the bed sheets talk about the body and, and, and figure and just expand on uh, painting or use uh, just uh, beyond the, the traditional, you know, it's like a, like a jumping off point from uh, traditional painting into, you know, out into the field or into the room. Right, like 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 the remnants of the body, or, the or like, um, exactly, or yeah, or, or something that strikes me about your work too is that it feels like um, almost like the, like the final moment of a performance or something, like what's left over, and and you ask yourself what that process was like, and 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 I always find that really fascinating. Any work that makes me think about the artist process because I know that that's such a personal moment, right? But all of this feels so very much performative in a way? Would that be an accurate way of describing it? Yes, it's exactly. It's like kind of what's left over. I was thinking a lot of uh, in the absence of someone or in the absence of a human interaction and uh, also as a way of um, abstraction to, to kind of uh, touch upon the body exactly at, without uh, representing a body or it's kind of a, you know, abstraction thought of as a uh, non-narrative uh, genre, but it's also very much of the world in a way with uh, using these, these, uh, these different items and household items, you know, things like that. Yeah, and can you talk to us a little bit about the title? And I'll probably ask you that as we go, because I think that the titles are sort of a form of an entry point for the viewer. They sort of force us to envision, uh, you know, this work as something or give us a, the, the initial kind of interpretation. So could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, actually, and the, the altar, which in Spanish means el altar. So I was thinking about, um, you know, the idea of uh, coffee and uh, coffee, also being a, sort of like a gateway into conversation and in, uh, in uh, Cuban homes or Latin homes in general and I, many homes, it's usually, uh, it's like a way of, to lead into hospitality where someone comes over and like, oh, let me put on some coffee or let me. So it's about that conversation and also the, uh, the object, the, famili the familiarity of the, the object as well as the um, familial ties, whereas you know the bed sheets, I explained that it was uh, you know a sister's bed sheets, and you know um, as she moved on from from um, I, this was actually from uh, my parents' home, and what kind of what I was thinking about what was left behind, and uh, also um, tying it into uh, the um, past life in in uh, Cuba also. And uh, so I wanted to kind of build this makeshift uh, like uh, altar to, to that whole, that whole idea of family ties and, uh, you know, household items and what you would find in, in a home in Cuba as well as in uh, here in Miami. 
Right. So, so the work is fundamentally personal. It's, it's a it personal. Is, it, is, it is very personal. Yes. Especially, uh, you know, with the items that I use. Sometimes they, they are um, items that are from uh, myself or my own family. And sometimes there are things that I, that I find, you know, that, or if I go on a walk, I, I find certain uh, residue and, and uh, items on the street that I bring back to the studio and then I kind of just leave there and, and maybe they don't they don't find uh, they don't find a work to belong to at the moment but they'll usually find something later on to to belong to I guess so. yeah I mean that that element of your practice is, is probably the main reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you because I'm always so fascinated by the use of found objects within work Right. And I think, you know, like what you just described is so surrealist, too, and how they would go to the, um, the, the flea market and they would purchase items that were, you know, like discarded and that no one really felt were important. But then they would subvert them into these really beautiful brand new art objects and they gave them this whole new life. So I'm always really interested in how that process goes. And I think that those choices are are so personal, like whether you realize it at the moment or not, that whole process is really fascinating to me. So to see the end result, um, as I said, it just makes you question the whole process overall. So, so thank you for describing that because I've always found that really fascinating, that whole process. Thank you. Yeah, so let's let's head over to the next slide. So now we're gonna go a little, a little bit back in time, right? We're gonna go to 2014 and we're gonna discuss more sort of the trajectory of your work and we'll make it all the way to 2019. So can you can you talk to us a little bit about Stomping Ground from 2014? Stomping Ground is something that uh, I was thinking about, uh, you know what a Stomping Ground is, is a, a place that's familiar. And um, I started thinking also about the landscape and the, la the landscape in my country of origin compared to the landscape here, which is actually pretty similar because they're both, um, tropical or subtropical uh, areas, you know, from the Caribbean to, to here in Miami. And I was also thinking about, um, because a lot of these things are, has to do with uh, my past or early childhood in Cuba, but also my immediate surroundings. And my immediate surroundings around like, uh, for example, uh, the Miami River or, you know, just familiar landscapes. And so I thought of the landscape and also in terms of uh, representing a landscape that is, it's not really representational, as you said, like kind of like the residue of a landscape. And uh, also um, the way I work is uh, the previous work kind of informs the, the next work or the next step and so on and so forth. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because sometimes, you know, I'm like, I don't know, I say to myself, I don't want to make it too hard, you know, I'll just do a painting and that's it, but it never, it never happens, you know, I always do something and then it just wants to keep going, like it never wants to uh, uh, find a conclusion, really, it just wants to like keep evolving. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've said before that like in, like in a curatorial practice, like sometimes the objects tell you what they want. Like they tell you if they want to be in the space or they don't, you know, like things happen in that way. So I guess that brings me back to, to the, another question I wanted to ask you, which is this idea of, of you feeling like the works are never really finished as, as a part of your practice, do you go back and like, for example, would you go back and tweak something from stomping ground in 2014? Do you feel them as ever evolving in a practical sense or more in like a metaphorical sense? I think uh, in both and, and also in terms of their their placement or their specificity to uh, a new placement, or you know a new place that I may be exhibiting the work, and also you know I I tear up old work a lot and you know I put it into new work and sometimes I can't find you know someone wants to exhibit a, a certain uh, work that you know well and then I have to say well that no longer exists but you know maybe I can use this in its replacement you know and. Um, so yeah, things, things kind of move around, you know, they migrate from, from one work to the next and, and, and um, they, they change because it's, you know, it's impossible to set them up again in the same way. And sometimes, and I think many times it actually works better, you know, where, where, where you know, because you, 
you know, maybe this socket existed there in the last placement, but it doesn't now, but now I got, um, you know, this column or something that I can work with that finds itself a part of the work. Right, that the remnants sort of remain even within your practice and they kind of go from work to work as, mm. as, as you develop your, not just your practice, but particular work. So that's, that's actually really, that's a really interesting aspect too, because you can expect to sort of see familiar imagery or familiar materials yeah. As, you, as you move along, and, and I think we'll see that in, in the presentation here as well. Um, let's, let's move over to the next slide. So we're, we're still in 2014, um, and this is one individual work. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about it and also about the title and just generally um, give us a description of, of the materials as well, because there's, there's a lot going on. <laughs> there, there is a lot. <laughs> well, um, Kimbombo, which, which means okra. In, in, uh, in English. And Kimbombo is, uh, I take a lot of my titles from conversations that I may hear in passing. Uh, you know, so I go out and, you know, uh, take a drive in the car and I might hear, you know, someone scream something out and, you know, that'll make it, or I'll keep thinking about it. But this one actually <clears throat> worked that, um, I think it was my father that was saying, you know, I feel like having a good plate of okra and, you know, we, you know uh, Cuban people love making our kimbombo with the you know, pork. And, and I would imagine in many other Latin countries as well as Caribbean, uh, the, it's kind of made in, in, in a similar way. But, and, and it's funny because when you have kimbombo, everybody knows, um, as well as here in, in the South, like, you know, that slime that it has. And then he's like, oh, you know, the slimier, the better. <laughs> so, so I was thinking, oh, King Bombo. And, and then I found this sort of lattice, um, this lattice work in, in the crocheted pieces that reminded me of the King Bombo, of, of the inside. You know, when you cut it, it has that inside. And um, so that's why I named the, the piece King Bombo, you know, conversation as well as the material itself. And um, this is actually a shipping crate that that uh, that I found while I was driving. I think I was going somewhere, and I found that on the street. So I had to like stop and you know get it. And I don't know where I was gonna do with it, but I knew I was gonna do something. Just didn't know what yet. And um, uh, it's important for me to say that a lot of the pieces are also um, the material is picked by uh, my mother, who actually collaborated with me on it. And uh, my mom's name is Luisa. And uh, she, one of the things she loves the most is to like go down to the, uh, the Goodwill, local Goodwill. And she loves going through stuff. And she's drawn to these materials that are, you know, they're not necessarily um, very valuable things, but it's just things that call her attention. And um, never tell, I never tell her, get this or get that. She calls me up. It's like, hey, look what I found. I found this. You think you could use it? I'm like, yeah, bring it over. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, uh, so yeah, I used. She found. Um, let's see, this, this, uh, uh, that sort of like I think that's a yoga mat or something, and that I turned into the uh, sculpture with the, uh, um, and I don't know if I can use my clicker to point here, but that um, bow that sculpture up here with that ball on the top and uh, the cushions. And that clip is actually uh, from uh, my father, who's a carpenter and he has a lot of the, you know, the clips around to, you know, from his tools and everything. And it's, a, it's sort of like a, uh, it's a painting wanting to be architecture, I guess. Like, I guess that's the, my best way to describe it. So your, your use of found materials, um, is that something that you were also influenced by like the history of art and other artists who have used found materials, or was this something that you primarily got from like your family, from your mom, who likes to find these found objects and sort of give them a new life, or or is it both? It's 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 all, and it's also, I I guess uh, the best <laughs> the best I can say is uh, uh, when I was a child in Cuba, I would play with um, it's that old you know just kind of use whatever you have around you know, art can be anything you know material is found everywhere. And uh, there wasn't a lot to, you know, actual paper, paint and everything in Cuba. So what I would do is I would use a lot of the tin foil or I would use string or, you know, anything I could find around. 
and and also when I uh, went to uh, you know school in New York, you know, like a, a starving uh, art student, and uh, I would find a lot of my materials out on the street, and uh, it's you know it saved me on material because it just hit me one day, you know, we're full of material here. Let me just use you know what what I can find, and it just be became something both that that sort of uh, intuitive play of material that I think from my childhood and also, you know, being broke in college and everything. And, and it just kind of, it became uh, my practice. It became the work. And yeah, it, yeah, to, 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 to be resourceful and to, to make use with what you have. Right. 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 Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, when I did this last studio visit back in December with Carlos Estevez, he said something very similar. He was like, my fascination with machinery is from having having small objects, watches, toys that I could break apart. And then I was so fascinated by how I could put them together. So even though he's not necessarily using those materials, you see that reflected in the intricacy of his work. So it's just it's it's just interesting how different artists also find different ways to be resourceful or how that influence makes it into the work in these different ways. Yours is much more, um, you know, you're physically using the material. Um, not necessarily reinterpreting it. So I, I, I find that really, really interesting because all of these have been repurposed to, to such an extent that like, I cannot tell at all that that's a yoga mat. You know what I mean? Like you're really kind of pushing it to such an extreme that it's, it's, re it's really, really fascinating. Thank you. And it's, it's sometimes the objects, and, and I, like, I seem to like them more when they're broken because I, I like the idea of, they they're no longer useful in the way they were so-called meant to be but they're still useful in a different way or they they find new purpose and also you know uh, objects have a history they have a life they have a you know whether positive or negative or you know uh, what we what we leave behind or what we throw out uh, defines us as much as what we buy or what we keep. Yeah, so, that, that's so. absolutely right. Let's head over to the next slide. There we go. So we have this is an installation view, uh, rock paper scissors from 2015. So we're moving we're moving up a little bit. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about just your your ideas of how you install your work, especially in an exhibition where you're exhibiting multiple pieces at a time. Um, do you see them as in conversation with each other? To me, sometimes because your work is is such a hybrid, right? It's it's painting, it's sculpture, it's installation. Sometimes it can feel just like an overall installation, like all the works are sort of like the symphony. Um, what is your what is your take on on exhibiting your work when it's when it's a solo show? Um, I kind of always work thinking of them as a, as a symphony because I I kind of always work uh, thinking. Well, if I were to have a solo show, how would these how would these objects how would these works play with each other? And uh, sometimes I'm not looking for. It, it all depends. Sometimes I'm not looking for similarities. Sometimes I'm looking for contradictions or, or a juxtaposition of you know something soft and something hard and and something that's uh, you know more uh, worked with something that has more open space. So um, it all depends, but somehow they all wind up looking uh, that that they play with each other all the time. You know, <laughs> they're friends. Yeah, uh, they're, they're in conversation. Yeah. They're, they're conversating, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, def I definitely feel that in, in this image. And I think something that's really interesting is that then, you know, this one of these works will go and be shown in a gallery or in a museum or some or, or in a home and they'll dialogue so 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 differently right than when they dialogue with your other work and it feels like one sort of large installation so they sort of live these these multiple lives so to speak um I, I know i'm diving a little deep there but i really feel that with your work because i feel like they can relate in so many different ways to each other like it like i said like a symphony but then you know they live a completely different context once they're placed with with other work with other artists work for example yeah definitely. They yeah have multiple they definitely have multiple lives 
Yeah. And, and I also just want to emphasize again, if you guys have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Um, this is uh, another, another image from the same um, installation from Rock, Paper, Scissors from 2015. So just a close up. Um, can you talk to us a, a little bit about the materials? Um, I, I see a lot of found objects here. I see the tennis racket. Um, where, where, did, where did you source some of these? Well, this, this, this uh, piece here is uh, the, one, the one that you see uh, towards your right with the tennis racket. It's called Trinket, and uh, that um, kind of came about a summer where I was, you know, I was like, okay, well, you know, I was losing weight and, 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 and thinking about, you know, my body, and, and uh, so that racket is kind of like, it's kind of like a, a trophy to that summer is where, where um, you know, I, I uh, did a lot of that, and then the racket broke, I fell on the ground, and you know, <laughs> and I couldn't play for a while because I, you know, busted my knee, so I'm like, okay, well, now I'm gonna, you know, the whole idea of, of broken uh, objects, like that, that, that espresso maker and that other piece at the PAM is also a broken one, by the way, <laughs> and so that racket got memorialized in, uh, in this piece, and I, I believe the, uh, the long chair I got from uh, from someone, um, and uh, the uh, Billy the Bass that I think what my mother found at the at the uh, the Goodwill, and uh, then I wanted to make a sculpture with uh, like the different cushions and yarns and and also the frame. So it's it's a an object painting. Is what, what I call it, and uh, so it's also you know the idea of the uh, expansion of painting. It's also a mirror in there, and um, a lot of the wood that I, I think uh, we're doing something with home building, and I found uh, some of those in the construction site, the sheet rock. So it's it's alluding to to labor, also to the racket exercise to the body. And um, this, and uh, the other piece is, and I think uh, I think there's a piece of a toilet tank on there also, the top part on the on the uh, the other piece, and that's actually part of a uh, the other piece is a part of a bed frame or or a backboard to to that. So Got it's uh, playing with the painting and the object, and where the painting becomes the object, and the object becomes painting. Yeah. And one of the things that I that I find the most enticing or the most interesting for me about your work is that 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 idea of hybridity, where these works are sort of taking up space um, in, in, in different ways or they have their feet, um, you know, on, on, on different lands, so to speak. And and I'm wondering, I mean, at least for me, and this is something that I had mentioned to you when we had a, a private conversation prior to this, but I said to you that the hybridity of it makes me on a on kind of like a personal level reflect on like my my feelings as say a, a child of immigrants living in Miami um you know how i feel like my footing is in multiple places at a time um and as a woman i feel like it's sometimes you know my responsibility and nor should it be okay i just want to be very clear about that it should not be my responsibility to do this but sometimes we feel responsible for proving to the world that we are multifaceted that we are multidimensional that we have our own stories our own narratives so is that hybridity something that i mean not just does it come from a personal place but do you also hope that the viewer sort of come to that conclusion from a personal level on their own, like I did, like where I'm kind of using your work to self-reflect, like how do you, how do you feel about that? Definitely. I, I would like, I like my work to be open-ended as well. And for the viewer to bring their own idea of, uh, into it. And uh, they can see that um, perhaps people can, can tell that it doesn't necessarily fit in one category, you know, the one singular category of that world. It's, it's kind of like, painting object or it kind of floats above all that like as you had mentioned and um it's definitely i'm 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 a uh i'm a multilingual or i'm a bilingual person and i'm a person that that um is not really i mean i left cuba when i was seven so 
it's uh, I'm kind of piecing together a, a history and also aware of uh, my immediate uh, environment. So it's 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 basically a patchwork of of uh, my own identity, and I think that comes through in the work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely feel that. And that's why I feel like I relate to it. And and my follow-up question to that is, how much context do you provide when you exhibit this work? Because I mean, right now we're having a pretty personal conversation about you and what goes into the work, but do you do you feel that it's necessary when you exhibit the work to provide that, you know, that that level of context, or do you leave it more open-ended for the viewer? I like to leave it a little more open-ended, and I definitely might uh put some clues in there, but I, I want, I, I put the objects that I use in there, what I'm hoping is that there is a familiarity to these objects that maybe um, it had to do with my history a little bit, but maybe, you know, you, you may be of a totally different background than me, but it's like, oh, you know what, my, my mom had that, or, or my grandmother had that couch, or, you know, oh, I have those same sheets. So I, I think these things uh, tie us all together in a way, though we're not of the same um, background or, but they, they find that familiarity, you know, um, it, it just, it crosses boundaries of, you know, crosses borders, it crosses, you know, it's, uh, it crosses different things. And it becomes, I think in that way, the personal becomes the collective and the collective becomes a person. Right, and, 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 and the power of memory that and comes with that, because yeah. some, some of these objects, like you said, they're, they're gonna remind someone of someone else, maybe someone they haven't you know, seen in a long time or back when they used to play tennis or you know, whatever <laughs> it may be. Like that, that idea of, of self-reflection is very, uh, very uh, interesting, obviously, and, and I'm personally interested in it, of course, because I, my show at PAM right now, The Artist is Poet, is very much about that. There's a whole section that's really focusing on not just the artist, um, you know, using the, 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 the actual process of creating art to self-reflect, but then how you can see yourself in that work and how you can use that artwork to ask yourself questions. Um, and it's a sort of scary thing to do, I think, sometimes to self-reflect. But I love that your work does that in a very, in a very kind, in a very subtle way. You kind of take with it, you know, take from it what you want. Um, so it's it's nice to hear that that's definitely part of your, um, you know, your goal with your work is to let people sort of bring their own experience forward and sort of place it on the work and then leave this collective narrative. Yeah, definitely. I I don't see my work as something uh, I'm not very serious with my work but it is personal but I, I want people to I want people to play with it basically mentally play with it and, and oh, well, look at that thing there and then maybe it doesn't make sense but you know they bring their own feelings into it as, right. as well. I right. think that's one of the great things to to um, I think sometimes when um, I, I have done work in the past that is more uh, literal and more uh, narrative based, but um, as I, as my work, I was actually started off as a figurative painter and as my work um, evolved it, um, which was hard for me in a way because I, I loved painting the figure and, and I still do, but um, it, as it moved, I said it started evolving, it started moving more towards that abstraction. And that's how I, I also started thinking about, well, maybe I can talk about the figure and I can talk about the body without actually painting a figure, a body. Right. And, um, so uh, that's how, that's also how I started pushing into uh, uh, materials and, and, and uh, using objects as stand-ins for, for the figure. Yeah. And I mean, and that actually leads me perfectly into a question that we received that says, do you sketch the works first or do you play with the objects and then let that become the final product? Like, what is your process like when assembling these works? Well, my process with assembling these works is actually making a whole lot of problems for myself that I then have to solve by how I'm going to actually attach all these things together. 
but no, there there are no no sketches. It's all um, intuitive, and um, I I feel like my my making is actually my sketch, if, if that makes sense. I hope I answered the, the question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so now we're we're at 2015. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about this work? Yes, this uh, this is actually the work that I believe was in um, the uh, Museum of Art and Design as uh, part of the Cintas, and this is uh, the Tropagalia, which, as you can see, I um, I started. Uh, you know, I love using the you know the bed sheets and and the linens and everything came into play again, and um, working with that idea of the body and also some of our uh, natural flora and fauna. And uh, they, these are actually, these are artificial, but there may be some um, uh, blue ones, some, some dried uh, palm fronds in there. And uh, again, the, the uh, crocheted uh, tablecloth, which uh, you know, made its way from one of the other pieces and uh, some of the cushions that those, that's actually also part of a baby crib. And they, uh, and I think that was one of my sneakers from uh, <laughs> my, um, I used to do a lot of, uh, I used to work as a scenic artist and, uh, you know, and I would often uh, go through a lot of sneakers. So I think this is one of them that made it on here. You know, I kind of tend to, uh, memorialize things when they lose their function. So uh, that's, uh, that's what you see here in the, this piece. Yeah. yeah. The, so question about the crochet, the, the, the baby crib. Some of your work too is using materials that I, that I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but that you're talking a little bit about femininity, traditional domesticity. Um, is that on purpose or are these materials sort of ending up and, 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 I'm, and I'm interpreting them in this way? Well, oh, actually, yes, it's it's a play on what we consider, I guess I, I should go into that where, you know, sometimes objects uh, we assign a certain gender to traditionally, like, for example, these tablecloths may make you think of, you know, maybe your grandma or your, your mom. And uh, a lot of the, um, and I also use industrial uh, um, object, um, sorry, industrial materials that are from uh, home building or fine and construction sites. And they may traditionally have had a uh, male gender attached to it or, or the person that would use that would be more traditionally thought of as male. So I kind of um, just play these things together and I am talking about femini femininity. I'm also talking about masculinity. And um, you know, you know, those, uh, those ideas and what they, you know, what they actually mean or how they play um, off each other. Yeah, and I, and I think you're also sort of shedding a light on what feels very obvious to some people, um, to me, that, that these are at the end of the day just objects and that what we assign to them is so, um, it is so personal, but it's sometimes silly, right? When we when we assign certain objects a gender in that sense, or you know, I'm supposed to play with a doll because I'm a girl, or except those things like that. Yeah, I feel I like you're kind of emphasizing like, that. Yeah, kind of, you know, kind of emphasizing that, and and uh, just kind of uh, you know expanding into you know beyond gender, and uh, and uh, the idea of objects, uh, you know tied to a certain gender or not tied to a gender? Why can't they just be objects? And just playing around with those things. Yeah, and get, giving them a new life without necessarily considering, uh, you know, what their life was was prior. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Giving them this completely, new, subverting them into this completely new form. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Let's look at the next slide. There we go. Stupid Tough from 2015. Before we dive into this, we did get a comment um, just saying, hi, Clara. I loved watching the process. Um, I don't have a question, really. I just miss seeing your works and you in person from Randy Berman. So you're receiving oh, lots of love. Hi, Randy. Well. <laughs> Supportive crowd today. 
So talk to us about Stupid Tough and, and please talk to us a little bit about, uh, about the title, obviously. <laughs> Well, uh, a lot of the things that I hear uh, in, in passing, they may or may not be directed at me, or sometimes they're a little offensive. Sometimes, you know, conversation is, you know, it, but uh, without going too much into that, I, this is, um, this piece is, uh, as you can see, some of the electric fan. Again, uh, the idea of uh, the expansion of painting and abstraction where I like to call it abstraction because as abstract is uh, the, you know, the lack of narrative. But I think that abstraction plays around in between that or at least my type of abstraction does. And uh, I was thinking about the idea of uh, when, you know, when you're little and your parents tell you, hey, don't, don't, don't stick your hand inside the fan. <laughs> So this is actually the, the checkerboard, the, that gingham uh, pattern is their um, sleeves from an old shirt. So I was thinking about that, don't stick your hand inside the fan thing. And, uh, and that phrase just kind of stayed with me. And, and uh, so I played around with that language. Uh, I like to play with language a lot. And, um, you know, just use that as a jumping off point into maybe a, a word or or sometimes it just stays into a back in the background until it makes it into a word. And yeah, so something something that I think I, I I try and emphasize to to visitors when they're maybe not so well versed in contemporary art or or they feel like contemporary art is intimidating is I always tell them well you know the title or text can serve as a really wonderful and very easy entry point right and and I'm I'm hoping that from people hearing you speak tonight that you know the artist is also really in hoping that you bring your own interpretation and that you bring your own personal narrative into it that there's no like right and wrong answer because when I see this work I I wear a lot of gingham so I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh this reminds me of my closet this reminds me of my mom um you know so it's just interesting because you know I want people to feel that way I want people to feel like it's okay to bring your own memory your own narrative because that's what that's the power I think of contemporary art is that it, it provides this um, this just this this possibility of genuine human interaction of using art as catalyst for self reflection as we've already talked about but connecting with people connecting with you even if you're not physically present you know they're connecting with you through your work right exactly yeah. you know that connection and I don't it some sometimes I would say it is what what you what you see. You know, I want I would I want you to think about the material or that that gingham pattern. Like you say, you had an old shirt, or maybe the other person has an old shirt, and I had an old shirt, and so, and and the electric fan. But you know, who wore that shirt? Who made that fan? Um, there's also like tablecloths and the be and bed sheets. Who slept on those bed sheets? Who who um, who ate? you know, who use that tablecloth. So it's, it's way sometimes these materials speak to uh, industry, they speak to labor and uh, speak to, um, you know, or, or certain uh, issues where I, I use uh, sometimes a lot of food, like I'm speaking to uh, not only still life, it, it touches upon still life, which I think this does as well, but um, you know, with food, who picks that food or who, you know, who, who takes care of those plants and so there's it's touching upon all these different things and like you said there's no right or, or wrong way to go about it but i think uh for me as an artist it it allows me that freedom to kind of to kind of in a subtle way touch upon things without making it you know so literal or, or making it about just one thing i like that multiplicity Right. Yeah. And, and I hadn't even thought of that, actually, but I love the idea of like how many different hands went into the production of this work. Right. It's not just it's not just yours, but all the you know, the people who came before who made that fan. Right. Who made that shirt like this idea of like you're sort of even in a way collaborating. Right. So, so yeah. collaborating with uh, those persons or the past lives of these objects. Right. Right. 
Let's uh, move on to the next slide. Okay. And before we dive into this one, we got a really, really good question here. Do you plan out the color compositions in your work or do they happen because of the materials that you gathered? They happen because of the uh, materials. And they happen because of um, what the color before, for example, if I use a blue, well, then I say, well, you know, maybe the next thing, the, this mark, this next mark here doesn't want to be a blue. Maybe it wants to be, you know, how, how can I make that blue look bluer? So maybe I'll put an, you know, an orange next to it. Or if it's a darker color, I'll think of uh, light and, and value. And I'll think, well, maybe something light next to it. And um, I think about a lot also, because my foundation is not in, is in painting, and that's kind of, that's just kind of my jumping off point. I think a lot about the physicality of paint and, and um, just of the, uh, you know, of the stroke of the brush itself and, and it, just how it goes on the canvas or in this case, it, wood or plastic. And um, I don't pick the color, but the, the colors tend to guide me along as to what the next the next step will be or the next color will be. Right. So the, the objects sort of dictate the process to a certain extent and then you 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 follow suit, so to speak. Yeah. What came before dictates what's next and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah, a, a sort of forever going conversation with between you and, and your works. Yeah. 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 That, that's a good word for it. <laughs> yeah. So we received another question. Um, do you ever surprise yourself with the end result of a piece? Like you start it with something in mind and then it ends up being something entirely different. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, in fact, when, when it doesn't wind up being something entirely different than, when I invest, than what I envision, then, then that's when I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, I think you, I'm very marked. I'm very much of a mark maker, so um, when I'm, it, the best way for me to describe it is the thinking comes afterwards. You know, when, when I'm in the actual process of, of applying the paint, I'm not thinking anything. And then I'll sit down and then I'll think, hmm, where, where do I go from there? And then that's not what I intended it to be, but well, let's see what it wants to become. Yeah, the, 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 trusting, the, the trusting of what the object is asking of you or, 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 or telling you yeah, that it wants. The object or the mark. Or yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Untitled Big Drop from 2017, um, is it's, it's really interesting because it looks a little different than some of the other work that we've seen so far. And one of the things that struck me about it is it sort of reminds me of like an Yves Tanguy painting, like a very surrealist, like these tiny details, but it's really entirely abstract. Um, would you say that that the surrealist or any other moment in art history is a is an influence on your work? Were you were you intending to to get there? Um, I mean, now that we've just talked about the the fact that you kind of don't really know where you're going to end up, um, and then just talk to us a little bit about how how and why this work looks a little bit different than some of the things that we've seen before. It's uh, definitely um, when I started um, becoming interested in, in painting, uh, I looked, yeah, sur surrealism was a big, was a big thing. And, you know, from Dali to the Cherko to Tanguy. And um, it's also, with this work, I wasn't, thinking uh, too much as an object, but it somehow ended up being a sort of object, quote unquote, object painting anyway. And uh, the, that background, that background that just, you know, drops in sort of like in, on the, the painting, on the stretcher there is, is actually uh, plastic and, and wood. So I was thinking how these, how these marks interacted with that with the plastic and the wood and how the physicality of that paint was different from the paint in, in the, the middle section, which is a, a more traditional canvas. And I was thinking of uh, value and shadow. 
So it, it's a kind of a two-dimensional wannabe three-dimensional painting. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's objecthood is sort of emphasized, even if it's even if it didn't really start out that way. So I, I find this one to be really interesting for that reason. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is an installation view, interior exterior from 2017, site specific. So you had talked to us a little bit about that, how you 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 take the space into account. Can you talk to us about that process for this particular uh, installation? And just as you can see, it's uh, interior exterior. So um, I was thinking of you know the our uh, relationship with inter interior spaces and exterior spaces. I was also uh, thinking about. I think um, a lot about uh, like traditional, uh, maybe Dutch golden age, like uh, like uh, still life and uh, landscape and uh, how that is kind of used. How I use that is, well, I don't wanna show you the whole landscape. I wanna show you fragments of a landscape or fragments of a piece of fruit, like that watermelon there, maybe, you know, you know how objects play into the still life, like these, uh, the plants, you know, curtains uh, from uh, an interior or, you know, the interior of the living room, the bedroom, wherever you keep your curtains. And um, the, the gallery had that opening there, which, you know, we wound up using and it played well into the, 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 whole, the whole idea of interior exterior in terms of, still life and landscape. And um, I, I like that, that it was spaced out and, and each work has, has room to breathe because I, I think um, a lot of times work that, that is, uh, that has an, a sort of like a sculptural quality to it and, and it's more installational, I, you know, you need that space. And, and so I think that that worked out that worked out well. I I don't particularly set out to look for a certain space. I just work with what's there or, or yeah. what I find. Yeah, especially I mean, especially work like yours that has so much detail, you know, that you want people to come close, but at the same time, there's a very different experience when you're far away from it. You know, like you have you have two very, very different moments. So when you give it enough space to breathe, you give the, the viewer the opportunity to go far away from it and experience it kind of on its own, and then also to get close to it and experience it in a more sort of like let me look at these details. Let me look at this abstraction. So um, that's definitely, I think, how how you know that the work is is um, functioning well within within a space. I think yeah, it was it was it was a fun um, exhibition. It was a fun show. Yeah. Let's. Okay. Thank you very much. It's like they read my mind. They know when the slide should change. <laughs> mm -hmm. So untitled Matador from 2019. Um, we did just get a question though. Um, has the intuitive process always been an integral part of your art making? I would say, I would say I started off, uh, you know, traditionally just, you know, making sketch, a sketch and, but, um, it, it, it has for a long time. I, I think it's just the way I think. I think my hands are my brain, maybe, you know? And uh, I think every artist uh, works differently and uh, some artists like a little more structure and like, uh, you know, set out to do a specific thing. And um, for me, especially when you work with, with found objects, it's, it's kind of like, well, you know, what you find. So maybe that's why I think if I would make a sketch, it, it would change so many times that basically it would be like, you know, so they rendered useless, you know, <laughs> you know, pretty fast. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's where I feel, um, where I feel comfortable enough, where it allows me the freedom in the artistic process to become what it wants to be. Yeah, and I mean, do, do you do you think that that contributes to the to the idea of it never being finished? You know that you're you're not aiming towards any particular thing, and so that pull to continue to tweak it and that pull to continue to manipulate it that that's that's part of um, that's part of that process. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, if I think if you leave anything around long enough in the studio, 
I always tend to go back to it or if I install it in a new space, it always tends to want something differently just basically uh, because sometimes they may need to grow in size or may need to shrink. But I do have some pieces that are definitely, you know, I could say, no, that's a finished piece, you know, but uh, a lot of my work is, is uh, you know, influenced by its immediate surroundings. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're running out of time. We only have a couple minutes left. I was wondering if you could talk to us about this work a little bit and then our last slide. And, and if any last second questions come up, we can, we can tackle them. So this, uh, this painting, this installation is actually installed at the studio and it's a uh, matador, which, you know, alludes to the old, the, the idea of the bull fighting, but not the bull fighting. And you, know, you see it, this play with like uh, the metal conduit there that says toro, which means bull. And uh, I just set out to not painting a matador, but as I started painting, I, I, I began thinking about that. And I felt that that piece in, in the background where uh, next to, to the yellow fabric there, it kind of reminded me like, like a figure with a hat. And I thought, you know, it looks like a matador and you know, the drapery. And it's just, you know, things, things sort of evolve and become, you know, uh, take on a, a, their own identity in the, in the process. So again, I'm playing with, with the painting and uh, the idea of the expansion of painting uh, onto the, the floor, or, or, it's a, a more immersive uh, environment. Right. And then that actually brings me to our, our last question uh, that I think is an excellent question. Do you consider Robert Rauschenberg to be one of your influences? Definitely. I, I look at um, everything from Robert Rauschenberg, uh, Judy Pfaff, Angela de la Cruz, uh, Jessica Stockholder, um, so many, Helen Martin, uh, for, which, you know, more contemporary uh, of this time, and um, many of those influences. And also, it's informed a lot of, uh, about, you know, the city and, and the urban environment, you know, in, in, in general. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just take a quick look at the last uh, image here. This is more recent work. This is from 2020. So is this something that was made during uh, during lockdown? And and how did that influence um, how did that influence your, your your practice during that time? It's it, it was curtailed, you know, a lot because I I I like to go out and you know go into the community and and wind up getting uh, a lot of times items and objects donated from people in, in the neighborhood. So I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't really go in the store. So, you know, whatever I had in hand, which is fine, you know, I work like that a, a lot as well. And um, this, so this is also installed in the studio. And uh, platanos is uh, plantains in, in English. And, uh, you know, again, playing, playing with the bed sheets that I had around and um, the idea of the landscape. And, and the fragment or alluding to a landscape. You know, I don't necessarily want you to see the plants, but you know, alluding to, to, the, to the greenery. And also I, I, I think um, this was uh, late 2020, I think. So I, I really uh, wanted to go out by then. You know, I think everyone was ready to like, you know, have some outside time and how important, you know, that, that is to, to our well being. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, I can't thank you enough for, for participating, for joining me in this conversation. We really, really, really appreciate it. And I know that there was so much more that we could have talked about. Um, you know, I, I know that we had other topics discussed. I have a whole list of notes of other things, but that just means that the conversation can continue um, in other ways. So my, my deepest gratitude for, you know, to you for participating with, with me this evening. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. And thank everyone out there for tuning in. And a shout out to Jerry and Morgan. Happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for, for watching and for sending us your questions, for participating with us. Uh, thank you oh so very much. We do have one last live studio visit um, coming up and that is gonna be on May 6th at 7 p.m. Edison Peña Fiel with our chief curator, Renee Morales. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, but again, thank you all so, so very much. Bye-bye everybody.